You know, with these Disney live action remakes, sometimes they make some big changes that fans of the original movies don't like. So they might say that Disney's being cruel. <laughs> What's going on everyone? Welcome back to my channel. Today we're talking about a brand new Disney release, Cruella. Before we begin, let me know in the comments what your thoughts on this movie were, if you already saw it, or if you were planning on seeing it, and make sure to hit that thumbs up button if you like these reviews, as it helps me out immensely by getting my channel out there. And if you're new here, I hope you consider hitting that subscribe button so you can stay up to date with reviews of new releases, older films, hidden gems, and so much more on a near daily basis. But let's not waste any more time, and let's talk about Cruella. This stars Emma Stone as Estella, a young and clever grifter who is determined to make a name for herself in the fashion world. She soon meets a pair of thieves who appreciate her appetite for mischief, and together they build a life for themselves on the streets of London. However, when Estella befriends fashion legend Baroness Von Hellman, played by Emma Thompson, she embraces her wicked side to become the raucous and revenge-bent Cruella. Now, I gotta be honest, I was not looking forward to this one. I did mention it in my most anticipated movies of the month video, but almost reluctantly. These last bunch of Disney live action reimaginings have ranged from very bad to at best okay. And to top it all off, this trailer gave the impression it was going to try really hard to copy Birds of Prey or Joker, so I had some low expectations going into it. The only thing that had me holding out any sort of hope was that it's directed by Craig Gillespie who also directed Lars and the Real Girl and I, Tonya, both of which I loved, as well as the Fright Night remake, which I actually think is pretty solid. His films usually have a nice sense of style, as well as some really solid dark comedy. So that was the only thing that gave me any sort of optimism here. But then again, there have been several filmmakers I regularly enjoy behind these other live action films that I didn't like, so I was still mentally prepared for disappointment. So I guess because my expectations were so low to begin with that, I found myself to be pleasantly surprised here. This movie is actually not bad. In fact, it was pretty good. I'm almost in shock that I'm saying this, but I think what helped is that, for the most part, this doesn't feel like any of these other live action remakes, for the most part at least. Honestly, it didn't even feel like Joker or Birds of Prey, which I was almost sure was going to be the case. I think the one advantage this has over a lot of the other live action remakes Disney did is that with the films that were basically retellings of the animated movies, you get this sense that they're just saying lines of dialogue from those films or hitting a lot of the same beats as the original films, but it felt more like reciting rather than containing the charm and heart that made those original movies as great. Not all of them were like that, but these last few definitely gave off that vibe. This, on the other hand, has the advantage of being a prequel, and it basically gets to follow its own rules. Again, for the most part at least. There are definitely a few times it felt like some stuff was thrown in there specifically as a nod to the original, or just to force a way to get these characters close to how they were in the original, which I'll get to later on. But for the most part, this has a personality all of its own, one that's considerably darker in comparison to the feel of some of these other films. Just saying something, considering some of these other films felt dark and dreary. But while this has a more adult-oriented vibe to it, for the most part, it wasn't dreary. There was an energy about it. Gillespie tried injecting life into this, as did all of the actors, all of whom added their own spin to each of these characters. With some exceptions, there wasn't this attempt at simply just trying to do an impersonation of the animated characters. This has some of the relationships be the same as they were in the original film to a degree, but this also tries to do its own thing for the most part. So where these characters wind up, it's not going to totally be in line with how they all are at the beginning of 101 Dalmatians. Now, like I said, I definitely describe this film as energetic. For one thing, unlike a lot of the other remakes, this one's basically a full-on comedy, which does play to Gillespie's strengths, as well as the strengths of all the cast members, and more on them in a bit. But it's a film that tries to have a lot of flair to it. Most scenes, especially in the first two thirds, are filled to the brim with rock tracks from Queen, The Clash, Blondie, and so many more artists all blasting throughout. Sometimes a bit too much, as a song would end and then a new one would kick in like not even five minutes later. And it did feel like they were trying to fill the air in with as much noise as possible, and at times I think we needed a breather, but... For the most part, I welcomed it with open arms, especially because that's all my sort of music. 
I also like how you'd have things like words appearing across the screen to show newspaper headlines, and you also had great camera work with a lot of fun tracking shots, especially during montage sequences, and the costume designs were all top notch. With it being a movie set in the fashion industry, it goes all in on the outfits worn by some of the characters, with a lot of the fun stemming from Corella finding ways to one-up her boss with more elegant dresses than she ever came up with. And that cat and mouse vibe to Cruella and the Baroness's relationship also made things a lot more engaging. This has been compared a lot to The Devil Wears Prada, which I'd say is a fairly accurate assessment. It takes place in the fashion world. You have this ruthless boss played by Thompson, with a quick-witted assistant played by Stone, who has to cater to her every demand, similar to that film. Now, while it's been some time since I've seen The Devil Wears Prada, I'd say this could be described as an even more cutthroat version than that is, especially since there are brushes with Estella going full-on evil here. But the film's real charm ultimately lies within its cast. Emma Stone is awesome here. While she has a great range, comedy has always been her strongest suit in my opinion, here with a very sharp sense of humor and nice sense of comedic timing. This sees her channel some of the same energy she had in The Favorite, which was another Battle of Wits style of movie, and I think part of why that is, is both films share a co-writer, Tony McNamara. But she clearly has a lot of fun with this role, and it shows every minute she's on screen. Emma Thompson is also great here as well. This sees her get to do an even colder version of P.L. Travers, I felt like, who she portrayed in Saving Mr. Banks, making a ton of demands from everyone around her. Though this time, her character lacks all the heart that Travers had. The Baroness is someone who's evil and almost enjoys being evil. She's very blunt, barks commands, and doesn't bat an eye when it comes to tossing someone to the side. And again, Thompson seemed like she was really into the role. And whenever both Emmas were on screen together, especially when Stone presented herself as Corella and not Estella, it was fun. You also had Paul Walter Hauser and Joel Fry as Horace and Jasper, who have a much different dynamic with Corella than they did in the original. They eventually become more like henchmen as she gives them orders, but they start off as childhood friends who usually work together as petty thieves, with Jasper initially acting as the brains of the operation. Though things shift as Estella gets more invested in getting the upper hand on the Baroness, and she takes over almost immediately, which does bother Jasper especially, and does lead to some tension among all of them. Now, Joe Fry was good here, though he plays more of the straight man of the group. In the original, both Horace and Jasper are portrayed as totally bumbling, if I remember correctly, but here it's mainly Horace, so Fry only gets so much to do, but it's still fine. But I will say, Paul Walter Hauser gives possibly my favorite performance of his so far, at least since Itonia, which was his first collaboration with Gillespie. A lot of the film calls for him being inept and saying the wrong things, but his sense of comedic timing was on point here. He provided a lot of the film's biggest laughs for me. His skills as a comedic actor are incredible, and I would love to see him headline his own film, because I think he would be great. Now, while I had fun with this, the film is not perfect, and I did have some pretty glaring issues with it, though considerably less than a lot of these other remakes. The main one being that, while much of the film tries to do its own thing and not so much pay attention to what was established in the animated movies, there were things that felt like they were thrown in there or changed because of whatever plans Disney may have with this version of the character down the line, or just as an obligatory reference to how the character is supposed to be. A big thing regarding Cruella's personality is that Cruella is meant to be almost this alternate personality to the good-natured Estella, who has a really bad mean streak in her, and this was a nickname given to her by her mom. Though that's tempered as she meets Horace and Jasper, and she simply stays as Estella, and they have a great relationship until she starts working for the Baroness. And I get that the obsession Estella has with the Baroness is driving her, especially as she learns about her history, but she'll switch from Estella to Corella almost instantly, and that personality shift becomes extremely drastic. Like, I'm not saying the film need to do this slow burn approach to the return of her Corella personality, but she flips almost like a light switch. She barks orders at Horace and Jasper, she immediately goes from being friendly with them to acting like their boss, and it's just very jarring. It's something they eventually address with her, but it felt like Disney couldn't trust its audience to be patient with what was being presented to them and just enjoy these characters for who they were. Because it's still pretty early on in the film when this happens, yet it felt like they were rushing out this transformation to make her somewhat closer to the villain. Which is funny because she never really becomes a full-on villain here, or do some of the totally horrible things Cruella's previously been known for. She has brushes with turning evil, but she becomes more like an anti-hero than anything. But this personality shift with her getting nasty with Horace and Jasper so early on, especially when you have over an hour left in the movie, 
felt like a bit much. Decisions like that run the risk of potentially alienating the audience, and there's a chance this possibly did. Though, because of the film's sense of humor, and its sense of style, as well as the work of its cast, that didn't happen so much with me. However, I will say that when this hits the third act, it takes a massive dip in quality. Like, had the first two thirds been a lot weaker, that final act could have potentially tanked the whole movie. Though luckily, it didn't. But basically, it's due to a major reveal we get here. And it felt like the laziest exposition dump I've seen in a movie in quite some time. While it did ultimately tie together some decisions that I found to be questionable from earlier in the film, it's just all said in one shot, and it goes on for like a good few minutes. And the way it's just recited really rubbed me the wrong way to be quite honest like they didn't even attempt to come up with a better way to convey this information and to be honest the last act in general definitely had a bit more of a sanitized feel to it compared to the first two thirds it was almost this reminder of, hey, by the way, we're still in a Disney movie, we're only gonna go so far. Which might also be why Cruella didn't become flat out evil by the end. But it's not the most jarring tonal shift I've seen, though I'm sure Gillespie and the writers had a different vision for the film, and this was Disney stepping in to say, hold up a minute here. You can tell it does feel slightly like a different movie, especially with its more overt teases and references to things that would eventually happen in 101 Dalmatian. Parts of it felt a bit contrived, including a mid credit sequence, which did not totally add up for me. But my issues with this aside, I still had fun with the movie overall. While it didn't totally stick the landing for me with that ending being one of the weaker elements, I still think the good outweighed the bad here. Cruella is honestly one of the better Disney live action retellings we've gotten in the last few years. While it's far from a perfect movie, with some jarring character shifts and a weak third act, the film is held together by its infectious energy, fast paced sense of humor, as well as a great job by the entire cast, especially Emma Stone, Emma Thompson, and Paul Walter Hauser. While I think more could have been done here, to me, there's still enough to make it worth the watch. Cruella gets a 7 out of 10. So let me know, did you see Cruella, or are you planning to see it, and what were your thoughts? Was this one of the better Disney live-action remakes for you? Do you have a favorite Emma Stone movie? Let me know in the comments below so we can discuss. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it, and for more movie reviews and film discussion, please make sure to hit that subscribe button to stay updated. Thanks for watching everyone, and keep having fun with film.